Hello? Ah, should we begin? Welcome everybody. Uh, this is a panel on education, um, Python education specifically, I guess. Um, I'm Daniel Pope. Uh, I am a Python programmer. Uh, I work for a hedge fund called Two Sigma as a reliability engineer. Um, and it is through my contact with teachers at the education track at PyCon UK and Nicholas in uh, particular um, that I was inspired to write a couple of libraries for um, uh, education to, uh, to teach Python through the medium of games. Uh, I am joined by Kat Lamin, who is a former teacher, a Raspberry Pi certified educator, a Google certified educator, and a CAS master teacher, which sounds awesome. A master teacher. I would like to be a master <laughs> Python programmer. Uh, Kat has been uh, training teachers for the National STEM Center and founded Cody Coding Evenings, which is a meetup for computing teachers. Um, next to her sits Tom Crick, who is a professor of computer science and public policy at Cardiff Metropolitan University. He chaired the Welsh Government's review of the ICT curriculum in 2013. Sitting next to him is Carrie Ann Philbin, who is a former teacher who now serves as Director of Education at the Raspberry Pi Foundation, is on the board of CAS, is, uh, and is a fellow of the PSF. Uh, and most recently, I've been enjoying her crash course videos on computer science, which are on YouTube. Um, and sitting next to her is Kushal Das, who is a core Python developer, a director of the PSF, um, and he organizes online training for open source contributors and has written a book on the subject. And he's been helping to organize a number of PyCons in India. So if you have a question for my panel, there is a URL up there. You can go to that and submit a question. You don't have to find a microphone. Um, you can also upvote the questions uh, that are there. Also, I have a number of questions pre-submitted. So I'm going to lead in with uh, an icebreaker, as, as they call it, um, and ask each of my guests in turn why they're passionate about education. So I'll start with Kat. Why am I passionate about education? Do you mean in Py Python specifically or just education? Uh, interpret the question how you wish, but yes, <laughs> this is a Python God. conference, so it would help if uh, sort of, you know, there's a, a Python thread to what you okay, say. Okay, so I'm passionate about education because since I was about nine years old, I wanted to be a teacher. I became a teacher. I was a primary school teacher for 11 years. Uh, my particular passions were maths and computer science, so I have an English degree. <laughs> um, and I just think it's really important that we give students, give young people the opportunity to become the learners they want to be. We don't try and fit them into a mould, we try and allow them, or we help them to become whoever they want. So, I guess that's my simple answer. I suppose I've seen um, massive focus on computer science education over the past kind of five or six years, particularly with how all the curricula across the UKs have changed and I mean even internationally there seems to be a massive focus. So I suppose when I first started doing stuff in Wales, um, I mean I'm a computer scientist so I was kind of disappointed to see how the perception of the discipline was quite poor. Um, there seemed to be a real disconnect between um, what was termed kind of high value skills or you know the kind of digital economy of the UK was predicated on having these types of skills. Um, and then there was a massive, there was a big mismatch between huge focus on STEM, so everyone was talking about kind of physics, chemistry, maths, and then there was this kind of, you know, oh yeah, there's some kind of computer stuff as well. So, you know, even to go into schools and talk to kids and talk to, to teachers to say, what are you interested in, what could you do with technology? Um, and then I suppose that kind of became a bit of my job um, as, a, as an academic, and then managed to try and start to change the curriculum in Wales, and we're, we're, we're at the cusp of... Um, the most significant curriculum reform in Wales since devolved education. So, uh, yeah, it's all changing and it's a really exciting time. Um, so, that's a really difficult question to answer. Like, why are you passionate about education? Like, everybody in this room has had some form of education. <laughs> and uh, I didn't enjoy school at all. I really disliked it. Um, I'm dyslexic. Um, I'm a little bit gobby. I'm from one of the poorest areas in the country. Um, I'm a girl. <laughs> I mean, you know, it wasn't a great experience for me, but I was able to give back to education because I could see that um, tangible, hands-on, physical stuff um, was a great way to motivate people and for them to become, you know, a really good part of the workforce in the future. So 
you know, not every child is going to grow up and be an academic. Uh, and I put myself squarely in that category. And I was able to have a really successful career in technology um, before retraining to become a teacher. Uh, and so I'm now really passionate about getting children access to technology, technology that they can mess around with, hack with, and use their creativity to make something that's meaningful to them and learn some skills that are actually beneficial to them in the future. So that led me to Python, it led me to PyCon, and it led me to this amazing community, which also seems to be as passionate as I am um, about education. <laughs> For me, it's a bit selfish. Um, I wanted to learn a lot of things, and the only way I understood is I can learn is if I find people who are like, self, uh, thinking the same way or know better than me. And uh, the part of India I am, uh, uh, as you know, in India we have a lot of people working with computers, and uh, computer engineering is one of the most common thing you will find anywhere in the country. But uh, people actually looking into the terms like contribution and open source, actual doing upstream work, that was not much uh, there. So, uh, and I always think that the people whom I meet outside uh, are better than me and they can do far better help to the community as a whole than me. And that's why I got into the term education because whatever I know, I try to spread those knowledge to others so that they can again pick up and try to help anyone else. And that's where I got into uh, teaching things. And family-wise, my mom and my granddad, both of them were teachers. Once upon a time, I thought I can become one. Till the time I figured out I have to study a lot. Uh, <laughs> so, but yeah, that's the whole community aspect actually brought me into education. And uh, something I'm getting to chance to learn every day. That, that is perfect for me. So I have a question from Dave Ames. What do the panel see as the biggest obst obstacles to the successful introduction of computing as a school subject? I'm going to start first. off with a primary perspective on this. Um, the biggest obstacle is lack of confidence from teachers. Um, there are some great courses and great resources out there, but for me, three years ago, being told you've got to teach algorithms to four-year-olds was pretty much one of the terrifying, most terrifying things I'd ever heard. Um, and okay, I went out and I learned stuff, but a lot of teachers don't have the time or the motivation. Computer science isn't their specialist subject and yet they're still teaching it. So it's really, really difficult for them to get going. And then you add on top of that schools not wanting to spend money on it and it it's, can be quite tough. <coughs> yeah, go for it. Go for it. So um, I think I would put CPD quite near the top of that. I know. Dave, you submitted this question, so it feels a little bit like a plant, but um, <laughs> uh, the, he's down there. <laughs> so on the 10th of November, the Royal Society are going to publish their report on the state of computer science education in England. And I don't know if you can remember back to 2011, they, were the, they, they launched a report um, which started, really started this movement around computer science and education. Um, and I suspect very strongly that there will be quite a lot of recommendations around continued professional development for educators. So you would have seen PyCon UK over the last four years at least has had an education track where we have encouraged teachers to come here, to be part of this community, to, to work with the developers here. We've run a Pi Academy over the last few days you know, to try and help train teachers um, in this discipline that, that this could be the first time they're coming to it. The government just kind of went, here you go, here's this curriculum, you've got to teach it and you're on your own because there's no money and we're not going to train you or give you any materials. So, um, you know, as a community, I think we're doing a really good job <coughs> to try and help those teachers. And there was a number of you who came along today to, to the Pi Academy and helped teachers um, learn some new skills. So definitely CPD is at the top of that list and there are lots of ways that you all can help with solve that problem. Continued professional development. I mean, building on from Carrie Ann's point, though, I mean, I think it's been a disruptive process. So, obviously, since 2011, 2012 in England, there's been the, you know, the kind of perception of this subject, this kind of cognate discipline at school. So, what was kind of traditionally called ICT in the UK, um, that it's been really messy. So, you know, I'm a computer scientist by kind of background. I kind of compiler optimizations as my 
PhD, but I actually have turned into a bit of a policy person because we're trying to help smooth some of this process because it, it was really disruptive in England. It's similarly disruptive in Wales because there's a perception then if this subject's not very good at school, then that reflects badly on the teachers who are very passionate and really dedicated in teaching the subject. So there's a disconnect between kind of ministerial announcements and also what actual practice is happening in schools. It's obviously different and patchy, but actually, I mean, that's, that's been the, the problem of when sort of curriculum changes happen so quickly, and it was literally, here's a draft of the curriculum in England, it's starting from next September, get cracking. And that's, I mean, that, that's, what, that's what happened. And this is, you know, this has been, um, you know, I think largely the changes have been very, very positive, but the way in which it's been done and the kind of the, the sort of the implementation of, of the kind of curriculum reform has been really, really messy. And again, I agree with Karen. I think when this Royal Society report comes out, which kind of backstops what was done in 2012, um, it's going to make some very, very clear recommendations. And I think it's going to talk about the importance of pedagogy and evidence to actually for effective practice. So it isn't just about let's do loads of programming in school or let's just do all this amazing computer science stuff. It's like, how do we teach this properly? How is this going to have impact? How can it be done in a cross-curricular way so we can talk about it's not just a siloed discipline, it actually can link with other science subjects, it can link across the entire curriculum for computational thinking and you know, using technology to solve interesting problems. So that, you know, we have a massive opportunity, but I think it's been, um, it's been disruptive. I can only say that I'm feeling kind of strange to hear the similar, the exact problems that we see in India, because uh, after a lot of uh, lobbying and policy and discussions, Indian, uh, actually the school board, uh, one of the major board, uh, CBSC, they changed their syllabus to include free software-based technologies and things to be taught in the school. Um, most of the high schools are teaching only C++ and Java previously. But now they have Python in the curriculum, they have MySQL and other terms, the generic terms in curriculum, but the teachers are missing the motivation why they should teach the other things or they, they can do something more than what they're already doing for the last 10 or 15 years. So as a com from the community side, that's something we all saw like in different parts of the country that like, they can't find a motivation to teach new things or even learn new things and stuff. So. Um, uh, Carrie touched on this a bit, but uh, lots of people here have put lots of effort into the microbit and the Python stack on the microbit. I was uh, curious as to what impact that's actually had on, um, we all received them last year, haven't received them this year, what's, what's uh, happening with microbit and is it having an impact um, that we hope it would? I'm looking at Nicholas. <laughs> 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 I'm supposed to be just carrying the mic around. Um, uh, I'm looking for Johnny. It's <laughs> <laughs> transitive. It's who's, transitive. Who's, who's uh, the CTO? <laughs> yes, too many pointers. Okay, um, let's let's leave that. Let's one. leave that. Um, I'm going to present. So, uh, just to remind you, there is a URL there. Um, I'm going to present a question from the URL. If I can work out how to do it. Hmm. Um, any tips for helping kids deal with the transition from primary to secondary computing slash scratch to Python? Um, I really love physical computing anyway. Uh, thanks to Carrie Ann. She's the one who bullied me into learning about it. Um, so I quite often do a project with year five, six, seven, eight, where I'll do some physical computing as in turn on some traffic lights using scratch and then demonstrate the exact same project in Python. And it's really, really nice and visual how the two languages are comparable, how the structure is similar. Um, and that, you know, that's one of the things I very regularly do in workshops when I go into schools. Yeah, and EduBlocks, I don't know if anyone's heard about EduBlocks. Um, there is a student um, called Joshua Lowe who will be here tomorrow. Um, he's giving a talk about this. He could see um, from his days in primary school that um, children were finding it hard to move from scratch to text-based programming languages, in particular Python. Um, and so he created a program called EduBlocks, where um, it's blockly based, so children who are used to using visual programming can connect the blocks. But what he's done is he's used Python syntax on the blocks, so that when kids transition to Python, they're sort of already used to the same terminology, and they can build their programs in 
Blockly, first of all, to understand how they might um, debug it or, you know, decompose the problem. So, if you are able to tomorrow, I really strongly encourage you to go to Josh's talk. Um, he's looking for help improving um, the work he's done on Monday in the sprints, and he's also running a workshop tomorrow for kids. So, I think any of those kinds of free tools are a really good way to transition pupils. I think I just probably go back to the previous thing around um, effective pedagogy. So, there's, there is a massive corpus of work now. There is a you know, thriving kind of international community of people who are doing kind of research into teaching you know, the effectiveness of how, how you teach programming and how you teach kind of CS fundamentals. Um, particularly this kind of transition, because this is writ large across you know, most education systems, particularly in the US, where there is a, probably a much bigger community of people who are doing this research. Is like how do we how do we equip teachers to understand the right kind of interventions and the right kind of approaches to doing it? And this goes all the way through the education system. You know, it's just as hard as, as a university in the sense of how do we teach that first you know that intro program language? You know, kind of CS 101. You know, when when undergrads are first exposed to um, maybe the first time they're ever taught programming, this sounds kind of a crazy thing. They select to do a computer science degree. That might be the first time they ever get to do they've been properly taught programming. And actually, that's really sporadic and patchy how it's taught. It depends on the, the language that they're taught, because there's still you know, huge variation in, whereas Python is making a massive resurgence in the UK as the kind of the, one of the, because of the education, kind of GCSEs and A-levels in the UK, it's, um, it's impacting on the first year, the first year program language, but Java is still the, the dominant language in UK universities. So that affects the way in which they're taught programming and the effects in which they think about how to solve problems. And as the kind of pull from industry as well. So, I mostly worked with um, like kids uh, 17, 18 years old or more. But I can tell you from my experience, my first day, 2001, uh, when I started doing programming, uh, uh, the whole batch was put into a room with computers where most of the friends they never saw a computer before and was asked to write some C code. So, I mean. Literally, few of us had to keep showing them where to press button to turn on this thing called computer. Uh, that was computer science degree for us. So it's, it's still a huge gap for us. Um, and actually, this is one area where I have an answer because I wrote a library called Pi Game Zero. Um, <laughs> and uh, take the opportunity to plug it. Um, it is uh, a kind of training wheels for Pi Game. Um, and teachers have told me that it is particularly good for. Uh, this kind of age where um, uh, kids have been able to create something in Scratch um, and then they hit a wall when it's a, a textual programming language, they have to do much more to, uh, to get results and Pygame Zero lets teachers show kids how to get results in tiny amounts of code. Um, so, let's move swiftly on from me plugging my own stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, let's take another question from the Google. How can we give teachers the confidence to learn from their pupils as well as the other way around? Anybody want to take that one? So, <laughs> little humble brag moment. I just spent two weeks this summer in Brazil um, training some teachers over there. And the first thing I opened with every single day was, it's okay if your students know more than you. And they all gave me that look of, no. Um, and it, it's really hard as a teacher because you're expected to be this sort of omnipotent figure at the front of the room that knows everything and we've kind of got to turn it round and say actually do you know what your job isn't to teach everything your job is to open the door as I said before it's, it's not to turn the to create the finished product it's to allow students to become who they want to be um, so it is a case of helping teachers to understand that and it's very difficult because it's not the person we've been trained to be necessarily how do you give teachers confidence full stop? I think <laughs> like, that's just a massive problem. I think partly as a culture we're responsible for that because teachers are the most downtrodden profession probably in this country. It's one of the hardest professions, I can say that because I've done it. Um, you know, I think with teachers, what I've found what, working with them through CAS and through Raspberry Pi is that they have to kind of see it and experience it for themselves to kind of have that confidence. Um, and so I think, you know, Movements like Code Club is a really good example where um, 
you know, you can run something after school. It's not going to, you know, Ofsted aren't going to come in and judge that teacher on it. Senior leadership team aren't going to come in and judge that teacher. That teacher has an opportunity to explore um, these ideas and these concepts and these activities with their children. With support quite often from a volunteer from industry who come in and help them. And I think those sorts of activities, stuff that happens on a weekend, you know, our education track here, you know, Coda Dojos, you know, Raspberry Jams, all these things um, will... will eventually help teachers have more confidence, I think. I think it's really easy to say in practice, especially when people talk about, oh, it's the kind of flipped classroom or flipped learning. It's really easy. You can just do this. This is the sort of innovative teaching practice. But actually, you still need to have an understanding of the kind of, you need to have knowledge of what you're, what you're kind of facilitating. And I, I mean, this is, this happens at university. You know, obviously, we get undergrads who come in who are genuinely gifted programmers. And that's fine. That doesn't bother me too much. Um, I'm an all right programmer, you know, kind of. But then if people come in, you can see their GitHub repo or they've already contributed to open source projects and they are, te you know, technically very good programmers in a number of different languages, then they'll obviously sail through their kind of intro programming courses. But actually then you need to kind of, how can you take advantage of them all to stretch them? And I think that's really, really hard in the kind of the, the constraints of a, say, a secondary, kind of a secondary school where there's much more prescriptive, you're kind of being monitored in this about kind of outputs and kind of GCSEs and A-levels. So I think it does go back to, you know, it's going to be my standard refrain. <laughs> you know, CPD is going to be, you know, the range of different opportunities you can help. And also um, the kind of environment and the sort of support networks they have. So, you know, through things like CAS and the range of different um, sort of organizations who are trying to support teachers. Um, they, you know, it's how they can easily access these types of materials and resources because teachers are busy so actually you know you say you can read this in the evenings or the weekends it's like cool thanks for that but actually you know giving them time yeah cheers you know and they've got a family and they actually want to enjoy their life and they want to go and do stuff so you know, how can you allow them access to to these to, the, to you know every, they're professionals they want to do stuff but actually you know, they, they should have time to reflect on their practice in their actual in their job so you know how we need to help facilitate that too and also, uh, doing these things in the university level seems to be much easier uh, because uh, in our last 10 or 12 year experience, we have few incidents where students got the lowest mark or once failed because the student knew too much <laughs> and enough open source contribution. But uh, like breaking the ice uh, with a little bit external, uh, I should not say pressure, but showcase that, hey, the community actually values this maybe student or kids uh, things they are doing and maybe just showing up with the name in some website and things like the student is doing things and then encouraging also the teacher or the in our case college professors it's like hey you are helping this teacher to grow so those things are slowly helping us on time um oh okay okay phone has locked itself let me ask a question from the googles again um, I have loads of questions, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, if you, we're not going to have time to get to all of the questions that are here. So if you get on that link, you can have a look at the questions that are there and upvote the ones that you would like to be asked. Um, what do you think we can do as a community to encourage schools to start teaching pupils to code? Uh, sorry. I, I, what, do you? what do you think we can do as a community, I guess this is the Python community, uh, to encourage schools to start teaching pupils to code? Oh, I should probably know that. Hardware. Um, actually, we are going to talk about a little bit more uh, in tomorrow's keynote. Uh, I don't want to say the same things again. But uh, <laughs> uh, seeing things in real life, that matters a lot. So. Uh, and in few projects which worked on some really rural uh, village school in India, we found out instead of trying to teach computer, if we try to teach the things they do in real life, like say science, arts, and other things, and show them that computer is just a, another tool to help you to learn those things in real life, that goes on much above than if we try to force people to learn programming. But if we just show that programming is just another tool, you can build some new stuff with it that helps a real, a lot more than anything else. That'll, that'll probably scupper my keynote as well tomorrow, because it's, it's, it's not the coding curriculum. And I think that's, there's been this message, you know, again, I think that the, the utility of programming, so you're kind of equipping 
young people to be to allow them to be creative and make and break in a digital world. But then when the curriculum started to emerge in the, across the UK, it was like, oh, it's the coding curriculum, as if that's the only thing you teach. So maybe, you know, again, this is probably me as a computer scientist saying, oh, it's a bit, it's a bit broader than that. We want to develop these kind of broader cross-curricular kind of computational thinking and problem-solving skills. But actually, we know that programming is a massive challenge because you, you, you want to have kids who, have, who, who are going to achieve a reasonable kind of competence of programming and not just going to be copying stuff off the board. They don't understand any they, you know, basic syntax, but we want them to get a deeper understanding of principles of programming, creating useful and usable software artifacts, actually thinking about engineering good software. Um, that's a really big ask in schools. So, you know, maybe, you know, kind of what are we aiming to achieve with, with teaching programming to everyone who goes through compulsory education at school? So I think, I think that there's a messaging problem about the, you know, kind of the utility of programming. And then, then it's easy to criticise the curriculum and say, not everyone's going to be a programmer. It's like, yeah, obviously, you know, not everyone's going to be a mathematician, but we still teach them calculus. It's about, you know, understanding and kind of framing the world. So, I don't know, I've, I always kind of, I object when it's like, oh, when we talk about programming, but again, maybe that's just about how we message that and how we can, um, you know, and then we get into kind of holy wars about talking about the languages you, or the tools you use. Actually, I just want people to understand kind of the principles of programming and the, and the potential utility of programming. Yeah, I think, um, I think as a community, I think the PSF, um, you know, in the Python community, we feel very strongly about supporting educators. I think my one tip would be, as Kushal says, like, just go and meet some teachers, right? Because they'll be very quick to tell you what the problems are. And, uh, you know, and we, we as a community have some great results from that. I mean, Dan mentioned his library, which now exists to help young people learn how to code and create games. Um, and, and Laura um, Satch, who's um, here today, she came last year. She wasn't part of the Raspberry Pi Foundation last year, but she came here and gave a great talk uh, about the problems of being a teacher and trying to access the Python libraries and Python to be able to teach. And she gave some really tangible <laughs> things, ways in which we can help. Like the first one is don't assume that teachers know as much as you do. So quite often, you know, people will say to me, oh, I wrote a library that will really help with that problem. What you need to do is go and pip install it. It's like, great, okay, what the hell is pip? How do I do it? Oh, by the way, I'm on a Windows machine that's locked down in my school. I can't do X, Y, and Z. Um, and I'm kind of paraphrasing her, really, in, in saying this. Um, if you can go and watch her talk on YouTube afterwards, I definitely recommend doing that. But like, uh, Pete Lomas, who is a, a, a co-founder of Raspberry Pi, always says, you don't know what you don't know. Right? So go and speak to those teachers, because they will tell you how you can help. And you will be really surprised um, about the, the, the myriad of ways in which you can help that teacher. And I came to PyCon in 2011. It was my first ever uh, trip to PyCon. And I met Nicholas Tolovey. And, and after that, I sort of adopted him as a developer. And uh, as I was learning Python, I would send him my code. And he'd say, I can see what you're trying to do here. Right? But it's, it's not quite right and, and sort of pointed me in the right direction without giving me the answer. And just having him on an, the end of an email was really amazing for me in my journey of learning Python. <laughs> on a slightly more practical level, if you look out for things like Code Club, they're looking for volunteers, people who can come into schools and help out. Um, it was mentioned earlier, I run a group in Twickenham called Coding Evening. Um, so I now know Tim Golden, wherever he is, really well because he comes and helps out. And we basically invite local community members, developers, teachers to come to a pub and have a play with resources and just sit and chat around a table with no pressure because teachers, at the end of the day, are tired and don't really want to sit and have formal training. So just we give them that opportunity to mess around and relax and make mistakes um, without any pressure. So looking out for events like that, I'm not the only one who runs coding evenings. I set it up, but people run them sort of around the southeast. And I'm kind of hoping other people will set them up in other areas. So feel free. I have a, actually a question uh, related to uh, what you said. Do I have a, like a minute of time, like make mistakes? Uh, if I can ask you, uh, I don't know how it is in UK, but in India, making mistakes seems to be a very bad thing in general and failure. So. Uh, we try to break that thing also, like people are not encouraging to make mistakes. Yeah. I, think, I think you're right. I think um, teachers in particular don't like making mistakes, 
professionals don't really like making mistakes. Um, but actually, uh, it's a big part of computer science, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, at Pi Academy, we say, you know, fail, you're going to fail, you're going to fail often, but actually it stands for first attempt in learning, um, uh, because it is. Um, and so, you know, just giving, it goes back to the idea of confidence and teachers having confidence. It's okay for teachers to be confident in saying, I don't know something, uh, even in front of their students, uh, and, and be able to get the support that they need. And I don't think that's there quite yet. Um, so we, you covered uh, some of the resources that um, teachers have uh, for teaching. Um, Luke asks, what resources are there for able computer science students at GCSE and A-level to develop their knowledge, given that uh, schools have limited computer science skills and teachers? I'm going to leave you guys deal with this one. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to plug video. <laughs> so this is my humble brag now. Um, video is a really powerful tool. You know, all young people access YouTube all the time. Um, they're always. You know, what really struck me when I was teaching was when I saw them, saw my students stop searching Google for answers and they started searching YouTube for answers. And that's what you know pushed me to start putting video content online. Um, I realized as well, not only were they using YouTube in that way to find quick answers, they like the medium of someone kind of explaining it to them, they like the, the video medium, um, but also they could pause it, they can rewind it, they can rewatch it again. And there are a lot of really great YouTube channels that are doing a lot of work in creating content around computer science. So not only is there Crash Course Computer Science, which is definitely pitched at a GCSE level, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I agreed to do it, and there's also channels like Computerfile, which gives really good um, information that's based in the University of Nottingham. I mean, CAS Computing at School has their own YouTube channel where they're putting content on as well. And I think, you know, if you're studying um, GCSE or A-level, that's a really good resource. And then the other one I would talk about, and this is something that as a community you can get involved in, um, I'm part of a, a working group of CAS called Hash Include. Uh, and, and we've had some funding from Google, uh, and we've been working on creating uh, GCSE and A-level wiki books, right? Completely open source books that are crowdsourced, um, which have questions and answers for GCSE and A-level students. And we're finding one of the, the best ways to give children access to this type of information, especially if they don't have um, you know, lots of money to spend on textbooks or they can't access um, A-level or GCSE computing at the school because it's not offered, which is the case at the moment. Um, we're trying to find ways in which we can give them the materials they need. So if you're interested in contributing to those wiki books, just look up CAS, um, hash include, or come and speak to myself or Laura and we can direct you to where those materials are. Yeah, I think I'd reaffirm the thing about video. I mean, we've seen um, um, having taught first year kind of maths for computer science for a number of years, I kind of see the, the, the gloom and despair in kind of undergraduates' faces when you talk about kind of um, propositional logic and kind of set theory and number theory. But actually, the, the, there's lo there are amazing resources to kind of explain some of those kind of core principles. And that just works just as well for, for degree level as it does kind of going back through, you know, kind of 16 and 18 for kind of UK quals. So, um, and I think it's that snappy kind of short three-minute video as well. So, it's, you know, you can kind of, you can enroll on a MOOC and see kind of, you know, an edX thing. And we were kind of discussed this thing, like, why would we try and create a 12-week thing on machine learning when you could go and listen to some people at Stanford who actually kind of are the leading people who do that in the world. But, you know, I think the, the wealth of resources, I suppose the only thing is how, how can we help curate and showcase kind of high quality resources because there is so much out there and you know if you do do kind of a, a YouTube search for stuff then you're going to get a lot of stuff back so actually maybe part of our role is to try and signpost some of those high quality resources a bit better. I guess jumping in from a slightly different perspective another way of looking at you know I'm, I'm really keen on project based learning and learning for a purpose so instead of just learning about lists because you need to learn lists why not find a project you want to do and then oh okay you've learned this as part of that project so i would almost say rather than looking for specific resources to learn you should be looking for a project that you want to do that just happens to have some more advanced features um, that's more how i'd like to learn anyway 
Um, I'm going to combine a question that was one of the most downvoted questions. Uh, <laughs> Steve says, can we stop calling it computer science, please? <laughs> With a question from Hayden. Computer science, software engineering, programming, computer architecture, and so on. I mean, you, you touched on uh, calling it programming. Um, they're each different yet related topics that people will enjoy and excel in to different levels. What techniques are useful in providing breadth as well as depth when creating educational resources, or is this even important? Project-based learning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mic drop. I mean, actually, there's a good point about the whole kind of the, 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 the naming of the subject. I mean, again, this has been a long-standing issue. Um, let's not go into this, but, um, you know, otherwise, you know, what, what we get, you've got to call it something. And, you know, I mean, I suppose any subject that calls itself a science might not actually be a science. That's always kind of the, the popular refrain for kind of computer science. But, you know, what you, you could call it informatics, but actually maybe people hear the computer more than the science, and they've got kind of a lot of legacy kind of baggage. Um, but again, I think when you look at the, if you do you know, look at the, if you Google program of study computing England, and you can see it's, it's a three-page document, you can see the, the point Kat raised right at the start around, at the end of key stage one, you need to be able to teach, or, or young people should understand about algorithms and some introductory programming stuff. So this is, you know, it's, it's a very light document, but actually the terminology is really, really important. And I think the way it's, the, the way, the better schools or teachers who have been really successful have been exemplifying that through, through projects, really kind of interesting, maybe cross-curricular projects that have been done in conjunction with science, with, with maths and other subjects across the school. And they've, they've had like a, a term-long project. So it might be, you know, Raspberry Pi example, you could build a weather station and you're going to collect data, you have to do all the kind of programming stuff, you have to do all the kind of hardware stuff, so you bring in D&T, and then you can, you've, you've got a truly kind of interdisciplinary cross-curricular project, which actually you've got a resource there and people can, can use it how they see fit. So otherwise you end up saying, oh, we've got to do some stuff about abstraction, we've got to, do, we've got to teach them programming, we've got to teach them computational thinking, we've got to teach them e-safety, we have to teach them you know, legal, social, ethical, professional issues. So suddenly, you then just kind of start ticking stuff off the curriculum rather than, right, let's think of a good project that we can encapsulate all this stuff. And often, like, things that are happening in the news can lead that. Um, I think, um, like, AlphaGo is a really good example of that. You know, kids will see that stuff is happening, and they've got a kind of... A some grasp on, on what that is and they'll come in and they'll ask you questions about it and actually it's a really good opportunity to then start thinking about AI and machine learning and so on. Um, so I think using things that are current or topical are a really good way of getting kids excited. I think cryptography is suddenly becoming a little bit of a, a, a buzzword and I, I think that's just another context as well that we can start grabbing kids and getting them excited about some of these topics. Mass surveillance and data retention, that's always another good topic. Sorry. And Brexit. <laughs> I have a question related to Brexit uh, that was, uh, that was uh, inspired by Tom himself. Yeah. Well, how, uh, Tom, how, how will Brexit affect computing education at university level? <laughs> this was a 20 minute monologue. Yeah. Uh, I've got 300 slides to go through, actually. This is <laughs> Genuine answer. I mean, I think um, um, there's. There, I think it'll be interesting to see that what the Royal Society report says around what computer, computing education is going to look like in the UK. And I, and I think that there's, there's going to be a lot of focus on the research base and, what, and kind of actually the type of research that's going on in, in UK universities to, to support the curriculum. If you look at all the other really well-established subjects in, in, that are taught in school, you know, the sort of subjects that have been around for a long, long time, there is a, there's a huge evidence base, there's a kind of the, pe the pedagogic approach to, to teaching these subjects, you know, it's particularly science and maths education. Um, you know, this is a really well-established discipline. And, I mean, I think part of this is about how we, how we interact with kind of international collaborators, because there's thriving European communities, unsurprisingly, um, particularly in Germany, uh, in some of the kind of, in, in Scandinavia, who are doing, who've been doing a lot of stuff in, in kind of effective computing education, particularly around kind of programming pedagogies. Um, and this is an international challenge. Yes, there are specifics to the UK curriculum, or sorry, the curricula across the UK. Um, but actually this is, you know, this is a global challenge for how we effectively teach um, this kind of stuff and it not just to become predicated on 
producing effective workers for the economy. That we are equipping people to, to live, work, study um, in a digital world. So actually, it's a digitally competent and capable citizenry, perhaps. So this is, a, this is kind of a societal challenge that we need to equip everyone to, to understand. Sorry, that was a bit of a call tomorrow. Right, yeah. Sorry, I know, I know. Yeah. Yeah. In my slides, yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to take a question from the Googles. Uh, why do you think there seems to be a problem attracting computer scientists to teaching? And what do you think is the best way to try and solve this problem? Because you get paid more in industry. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you don't get paid a lot of money. Um, you have to really, it's a calling to go into schools and, and try and teach this. You know, like the government needs to give some more money to teachers. <laughs> End rant. <laughs> Well, given that that's uh, not going to happen. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What yeah, do you but think? We just said it. We did. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, what? what uh, how can? How, how do we work around that? I don't necessarily think you want computer scientists in the classroom because, well, not necessarily. That was a sorry. That was a bad yeah. phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Keep away. Um, in the sense that. As Carrie Ann said, teaching is a calling. It's a profession that you are passionate about. To become a good teacher, you need to be passionate about teaching. Um, I've seen in my day teachers that should not have been at the front of a classroom. Um, and so, you know, you don't want to just force people to do the job because they feel like they have to. The better method would be to support existing teachers to make sure that they are able to do the job they want to do. Yeah, I, th I think there are ways of incentivising, but I think there's, it's, it's, an, it's an impossible task. You know, um, it was announced by the Welsh government's kind of cabinet secretary for education this week that they're raising the bursaries for, you know, strategically important subjects to attract if you've got a first class degree to go into teaching. But that's, you know, like Carrie said, like that's, it's never going to compare against, um, you know, uh, being a quant in a bank, for example. So, but then. Who cares? You know, actually, you want to try and attract people who, who care about teaching and who actually have a deeper interest in, in doing that type of role, but actually you want to provide the environment in which they can be effective and they, have an enjoy, you know, they, are, they enjoy what they do rather than largely grinding them down. And that's not a great thing. That's, you know, that's, all of my interaction with schools has been teachers. We're trying to get teachers to do stuff who are already at maximum capacity or they are over capacity. So actually, we need to kind of change some of that structural stuff. It's only now, I think, that you are attracting people who may have more discipline knowledge because they are quite, they, they're seeing all the kind of reform and they, they're quite keen to do stuff in schools. But actually, you know, I think we need to give them the environment which they can flourish and, and they can do stuff in schools, not um, let's pay them 90 grand and uh, try and beat uh, an investment bank as a quant. And also, uh trying to get people who are actually outside this circle of computer science and trying to get them into the classrooms and talk about things they are passionate about and how computer actually helps them to get into the step. The way like it was always said that project works and things like how people actually use the thing at the end of the day, that helps a lot for catching up things. Then, I mean, I would be scared if someone who comes in my class says I'm a computer scientist because, yeah, I'm weak in math. <laughs> okay, another question. As an experienced programmer, I have come to realize, uh, this is NASA, uh, that the most important tool pro yeah, okay, I, you're just reading it for yourselves. Uh, <laughs> I've come to realize that the most important tool programmers have is their problem-solving skills. Do you think that Python should be introduced at an early stage, or should we develop other skills in kids before introducing them to their first programming language? Step back, everyone. Tom's going to <laughs> there is a corpus of research on this. Um, I mean, again, the, the, the thing about introductory programming, what do you choose is, what do you select as your introductory programming language? I mean, um, speaking from a university perspective, I would say, unsurprisingly, Python's quite a good example of a language to teach because it's multi-paradigm. You can, there's, it's, it's a nice language to, to kind of, to, to, to step into. You know, whether you would teach it as, to five-year-olds, I mean, I'd say unlikely. But then ditto, I'd say teaching C++ at school is probably not a great idea. So, you know, I suppose you want to teach a deeper understanding of the principles of programming. You want to, you know, they need, clearly need some syntax and some easily accessible syntax and easily accessible 
kind of semantics to, to express themselves in a, in, a, in a language to solve a problem. Um, but then you don't want it just to become, let's teach them this language. That's not, that shouldn't be the end game in schools. Um, and that's invariant to any language. You know, I, I, for many years I taught a, a, set, a, a Java module at a university. Um, and I think some students seem to think that was, I'm going to learn Java as well. And I, we're teaching principles of programming and it's just because Java is the kind of conduit for doing that. Um, and I think, and I would agree with the point around how do we develop those, those broader kind of problem solving skills, but you need a domain in which to reason. So you need to give them some, um, some syntax and semantics for them to be able to express themselves in a language. So you have to pick a, a, a suitable language. And I think Python is one of those, but probably not all the way back. Um, I think you know, some of the kind of visual programming languages are a very, very good example of how they're much more accessible. But you want to then start to build up their their kind of um, understanding of syntax and semantics for them to, to, to do more complex problem solving. I think there's something a, a child psychologist would probably want to get involved here, where one of the things we're trying to do is teach problem solving skills to children who are sort of, you know, key stage one, so around the age of five. Um, and one of the ways we're trying to do that is to get them to solve problems. But actually, it, what happens if some of the kids can't solve the problems? What does that do to their self-esteem? Right? And we keep pushing this and pushing this and pushing this to the extreme at the moment, like they must be able to solve problems. Right? And I think we should just be careful and not try and do too much too young uh, and go back to what Kat was saying around having fun and being creative and, and, and using project-based learning as, a st as the starting point that actually, it, you know, if they can't solve the problem, it's not the end of the world. Um, I mean, from a more practical perspective, I taught in a, an independent school where the children were very, very fortunate, but I still had seven, eight-year-olds who couldn't type when they, if they came from another school and hadn't had the same background as my students. You can't really start introducing Python until children are at least vaguely fluent on a keyboard and in writing their own name. Um, so you've got to think from a practical perspective. That's actually same with uh, most of the university students as we find, like they know computer, they can type with one finger, but at the, instead of teaching them programming, we try to teach them as communication skills and touch typing as the first thing. And programming can come later sometime. And just a very quick point around problem solving. So this is obviously, this is featured in, you know, particularly in the UK as a, as a key skill. I mean, let's teach them problem solving skills. But invariably what happens is they teach them very specific problems and once they know how to solve them, that's the trick. It's like being asked, you know, in an interview, ask this kind of, you know, an arcane question. And once you know the answer, then you know the answer. It actually doesn't, but it doesn't equip you then to transfer that problem solving ability to anything else. So that's, that's largely what's happened when they've tried to teach disconnected problem solving skills that aren't kind of embedded in other things. So we have to be really, really careful about um, yes, we recognise problem solving skills are really, really useful, but the, they have to be done in the right way, for sure. And one of the things we've started talking about now in schools is computational thinking rather than problem solving. Um, and there are wonderful activities like barefoot. So instead of getting on a computer and doing a physical activity, you learn about computational thinking, about computer logic and things like that by, for example, writing an algorithm to draw an alien. That's one of the classic activities that you see in every school ever. Robot jam sandwich. Yep, yes. the robot. Yeah, the yeah. um, So, you know, rather than saying we should be teaching this specific language at a young age, it's more a case of developing the skills at a young age, developing an understanding of how a robot would move or how you would write an algorithm. I'm completely blank for ideas right now of other examples, but um, <laughs> conditionals, how would you get dressed in the morning? Think about if it is sunny. Um, and that's more important, understanding the sort of mm. language, the context, rather than a specific language. Yeah, so, so instead of just teaching, you know, like a, a sorting algorithm, you can then basically do it in PE and get people to run around a hall and do stuff. So rather than saying, let's just teach them, you know, merge sort or quick sort, <laughs> you actually you do it as part of a PE lesson. So it's much, you know, and this is great for primary school kids because it's quite stealthy anyway. Okay. What role has Python and Raspberry Pi played in bringing programming education to the developing world? Um, I'm looking at my trustee, who's that over there. <laughs> I, think, um, I think it's probably fair to say that um, Raspberry Pi, um, when it was developed and made as a product, um, I think 
the goals of the foundation and of the co-founders was very much close to home. It was about the, the UK and getting, in particular, undergraduates you know, uh, better skilled. I think it was actually a real surprise that there was this amazing side effect that because of the low cost of the platform um, that, it, that it was beneficial to countries um, uh, around the world and in the developing world. And we see some amazing projects um, and um, amazing stories coming out of countries all over the world. Um, and I know I've spent a lot of time over the last two days talking to Kushel about, <laughs> about this kind of thing, and I'm sure he can talk better about it. Um, but for the foundation, you know, we're, we're in the process of, of putting together our, our next three-year strategy, uh, and I would, I would be surprised if, um, if we didn't focus more on the developing world in the next few years as we expand as an organization. I want to say thank you, Raspberry Pi Foundation, uh, to make it available to the world because that I see as an Indian as the biggest challenge. We always read about things, or these days we can see things over YouTube, but actually being able to touch something or go order something online and get it within a couple of weeks without spending five times price, that's a beautiful thing, and it changed a lot of things. Like uh, We discussed a couple of times about, uh, here Raspberry Pi is mostly looking at the kids, uh, starting education stuff, but in India we suddenly saw that many people looking at Raspberry Pi as their first IoT device and even engineering colleges, electronic students are picking up Raspberry Pi as the device, uh, the first choice to work on uh, hardware related projects and things and just making it available so that people can actually buy it, that's a great thing and thank you for this time. Thanks Pete. <laughs> Okay. Um, what, is the, okay. what is the panel's opinion on the different approach to computing education in England and Wales? Well, you're in Wales, so Croeso uh, Prinhamda. Uh, um, I think, I mean, I think it, w it probably hasn't been an explicit thing to change, you know, let's not do it like that. I mean, this is, <laughs> this, this is more political, you know, obviously, you know, there's devolved education across the four nations of the UK. Um, and in the past, there's been many instances where um, sometimes it's the other three say, oh, well, let's not do it like England for the sake of kind of politics. But actually, being a few years behind some of the implementations in England has probably been useful because we can see um, just you know, there's a better way of doing things. Or just because of circumstance, it wasn't possible to, to anticipate the massive CPD challenge or the the kind of confidence and capability challenge, or just the ability to recruit teachers fast enough to deliver the new curriculum. So I suppose we have a bit of a run up to that in Wales. Um, so I chaired the ICT review for the Welsh Gov in 2013. Um, that kind of went into a, a wider complete curriculum review that was published in 2015. And now we're just starting to see the fact that we've separated out digital competencies as this cross curricular um, idea with literacy and numeracy but we're going to have a, a strand of computer science in this new science and technology area of learning and experience. So it's going to look a bit more like Scotland's curriculum than England anyway, but actually we're just kind of repositioning about, um, you know, what do we want to teach, what's it going to look like? We're going to go down this kind of big ideas thing, so how can it sit across with the other kind of STEM subjects? Um, so, but I think there's still exa you know, exactly the same challenge we're going to have around confidence and capability, access to professional development and training, access to, you know, how do we recruit teachers into the profession um, and, you know, essentially the perception of the subject. So we need to convince head teachers, we need to convince parents and the general public that oh, this is actually a useful thing because, you know, many head teachers don't see any difference between a GCSE and ICT and a GCSE in computer science. One of those has a significantly higher pass rate, A star to C. So how do we articulate what that means for this is a, this is a, a challenging qualification. This is going to be very different to what you expect in the past. So some of that is about messaging and communication. And maybe it's easier in Wales because of the kind of tractability of the problem, the kind of, you know, the, the size of the nation. Um, but we have that rural urban problem where, you know, it's, it's okay in the southeast, you know, in, in kind of Cardiff. But if you go up into kind of Ceredigion in the kind of mid Wales or into West Wales, into North West Wales, then schools are 45 minutes apart. So how do you get secondary teachers to kind of come together you know, through kind of a CAS hub or through master teachers, that's really, really difficult. So it's, you know, how do we build that community of practice and get teachers and, and people kind of ch and chatting together and supporting each other through this process? Obviously, it's going to be better in Wales. 
but <laughs> actually, I'm scuppered now, so you yeah, come back to me in three years' time. But you know, I think we 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 have a very clear direction, and um, and there's the political will to do it properly as well. I'm just pleased it's there at all, right? So I don't mind how it appears in a curriculum. The fact that it is there is the best starting point. And I think, you know, we're seeing the emergence of computing curriculums all around the world. So um, I've worked with Australia on their curriculum, and each country is implementing it in a different way. But actually, as Tom says, the challenges are exactly the same. And I think what will be interesting is not kind of how we're dealing with it now, but what does it look like in five years' time and so on. And I can definitely see, you know, off the back of the Royal Society report, not only will there be changes to how we try and, uh, you know, provide computing education in England, but I think that will affect what does that curriculum actually look like probably in the next few years as well. I mean, one thing that people might not be aware about um, is the GCSE qualifications around computer science. You know, it's really hard being a teacher. What makes it even harder is when the exam board changes the specification every single year. So there are teachers who for the past three years have had to upskill, not only in the subject overall, but in the particular specifications of the qualification. And then they're teaching that to one year group and then it changes and they have to go through all of that again with the next year group. So we'll be teaching year 10 and year 11, <laughs> two different exam specs at the same time, and then the third year comes along and they have to change that again. So I think actually what, it's great that these curriculums are happening, but we really need a point where they just stop changing and actually we have a period where teachers can practice and just get used to teaching it as it is. So I'm, I'm looking, I'm well, I look forward to that day. Um, okay, uh, so we have very little time left, um, so quick for our answers. Um, what single change do you think would have the biggest positive impact on computing education? Nice easy one there. Mm. Quick for our answer. Lots and lots of money from government invested <laughs> in teachers. <laughs> <laughs> Money. Um, okay, one last question then. Um, overall, are you optimistic about computing education in the longer term? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, without a doubt. I th I, so much has happened over the past kind of five plus years. It's amazing how much has happened, and obviously it's been a bit scary. It's been disruptive. It's been not all of it's been great. But actually, we are, you know, we have a subject in school, we have a much bigger public perception or awareness of, of why this is a really useful thing to teach to young people and teach to everyone. Um, so, yeah, no, that's, that's a complete, you know, that's transformationally different from what it was like when I was at school. I, so I have no computing qualifications from school because it, was, it sort of predates um, ICT as it was in the UK. So I'm a computer scientist in spite of not having done any of this at school. Okay, um, big round of applause for my panellists. Right,